The committee will come to order. Um, we want to welcome you all here. Uh, uh, I'd like to recognize myself for uh, a first five-minute opening statement. From our first hearing of this Congress, we have continued to focus on the impact of federal regulations can, can have on the economy, particularly on job prospects. We have heard from administration officials speaking for the White House, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, and even the Department of Homeland Security. We have asked them, did you take economic impacts into account when you proposed these regulations? Did you perform a job impact analysis? Are you concerned as much about protecting existing jobs, particularly in the manufacturing and energy sectors, as the President claims to be about creating new jobs in the so-called green economy? The problem for many of the people who send us here to find a solution is not the green economy. It's the red ink economy. Family debt, unemployment, collapsed home values, mortgages underwater. These are real life problems we are challenged to solve. And witness after witness before the subcommittee has traced the root of many of their challenges to the burden of federal regulations that drive up cost of doing business while adding no economic value. That is not to say that all regulations are bad. I am thankful for many good and important federal regulations. For example, every time I take a flight home to my family, I'm thankful for the federal aviation regulations that keep planes flying safely from one place to another. When you step outside this building and take a deep breath, even our, on a hot summer day, you can thank federal and state regulations for the improved improvement in air quality over the past 10 or 20 years. I don't want the ranking member of the full committee to faint on that statement, but uh, we all know that that's true. Um, and just yesterday, this committee overwhelmingly reported out a bill to set up an innovative new regime that balances state management and federal standards to ensure safe handling of coal ash while it recycled or disposed of as waste. But then we hear the horror stories about re other regulations. We have heard from witnesses about EPA proposals to impose needless new burdens on hard rock mining that duplicate what other federal and state agencies already have on the books and which could put some facilities out of business. We hear about proposed restrictions on recyclers that could actually discourage beneficial reuse from uh, fly ash to printer's ink. Enough of the problems. We are not psychologists. We need solutions to prevent the issues that have us in this predicament. Today we will hear from the small business sector, the farm community, the manufacturers, and other business voices. We hope our witnesses will bring along some suggestions uh, to make things better. How can we guide the federal government toward good regulations? How can we make sure that the benefits really do outweigh the economic cost? Can we be sensitive to impacts on job opportunities? We'll also ask, are there any laws in the books that can become a model regulatory approach? If so, what is it? And what other steps can Congress take to ensure the administration only proposes regulatory action that serve the people instead of harming them? And, and just on a side, when we travel back to our districts, um, every week, and we hear from our farmers and our small manufacturers and the small businesses, we hear this concern everywhere we go. This is, hearing is an attempt to put a, a, a national voice and, and bring forth the concerns that we're hearing at home at the at national level. So I appreciate you all uh, attending. I look forward to the hearing. And now I'd like to yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Bean from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, for calling this hearing because we all share an interest in ensuring the appropriate balance between cost and benefits of environmental regulation. This committee has held numerous hearings to examine the regulatory look-back process envisioned by the President's January Executive Order. Executive Order 13563 calls for federal agencies to develop preliminary plans for periodically reviewing existing regulations to determine whether any should be modified, streamlined, expanded, or repealed. While I certainly share my colleagues' concern about certain regulation, I do not believe that all regulations or even the process of reviewing a regulations is overly burdensome and hurts the economy. By focusing on regulatory cost to business, we sometimes risk ignoring the real, uh, very real human cost of unchecked pollution and the cost that these burdens place on the economy as a whole. I'll give you an example. For years, I've worked with local officials in Harris County. I have a very urban and industrial district in East Houston, uh, Harris County, Texas, to address a significant threat from a Superfund site that's in our area, the San Jacinto Waste Pits. In the 1960s, a paper mill that actually uh, was in our district dumped dioxin-contained waste in a waste pit in a sandbar in the San Jacinto River. 
Unfortunately, the Resource Recovery and uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act had not been passed, and neither had the EPA in 1969, until 1969. Regulations for the disposal of docks and waste from paper mills were not yet developed. If these regulations had been in place, the waste would not have been dumped where they were, and the Superfund site would not have been created. Now that the, now the, the San Jacinto River has reclaimed that sandbar, these vessels are, were below water. The contamination is widespread, and cleanup will be, is, will be very costly. Harris County officials and the EPA have been working hard to ensure taxpayers don't bear the cost of that cleanup, and they're continuing the fight. Proper waste regulations could have avoided these cleanup costs and these litigation costs and could have protected the people in my district. Examples like this demonstrate why it's so important to review the laws and regulations to ensure we protect public health, the environment, and the economy. OMB estimated that the economic benefits of major regulations over the last 10 years have found tremendous benefits up to six, $616 billion. The benefits outweighed the cost by 3 to 1 and by much as 12 to 1 in some cases. The economic benefits of environmental regulation offer reflected avoided costs, costs associated with treated asthma attacks, costs associated with educated ch educating children to, uh, with developmental delays costs associated with lost worker productivity due to pollution-induced illnesses. So while I agree we should carefully examine regulations, sure we are not inadvertently harming jobs, not all regulations are the enemy. They do protect the public and it is to save the federal government money and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair recognizes the uh, Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Mr. Murphy from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By the way, we do have a psychologist on the committee. So we and it's not me. <laughs> While deliberations are continuing uh, to deal with our $14.3 trillion deficit, more debt, Americans are concerned where we're going. June unemployment at 9.2 percent and the growth of only 18,000 jobs translates to a meager 360 jobs per state. Let's keep in mind that one way to balance America's budget, one very important way to deal with America's debt is to grow jobs. For each 1 percent decline in unemployment, it's $90 billion to $200 billion per year in federal revenue. That's a decrease in unemployment compensation. That's an increase in federal revenues. That's one and a half million jobs for every one percent decline in unemployment. But we can grow jobs and we settle job creators with 1.75 trillion in regulatory costs, according to numbers from the Small Business Administration. As we look at these issues of how to deal with a wide range of energy sources, I want to highlight another way we can create jobs. Instead of sending 129 billion a year to OPEC for foreign aid, to buy their oil, let's drill and use our own. A bill I introduced, H.R. 1861, the Infrastructure Jobs and Energy Independence Act, would yield between $2.2 trillion and $3.7 trillion over a 30-year period in new federal revenues. But it's not from raising taxes. It's just using the standard royalties and lease agreements that come from this. And it's not borrowing from China. This bill leads to 1.2 million jobs annually. It's jobs for the roughnecks, the steel workers, the electrician and laborers who work in these rigs. It's jobs for those who take the oil and refine it into gasoline. It's jobs for those who build all the infrastructure, as this bill also provides the money needed to begin to build and rebuild our roads, bridges, locks, dams, water and sewer projects. And it funds uh, nuclear power plants and the cleaning up of our coal-fired power plants. So with our leaders over the White House arguing over how to take care of the debt, let's not forget Americans are saying grow more jobs to grow more taxpayers, not find ways of increasing taxes, and not finding ways of increasing regulations that move our jobs into submission. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Seeing uh, no other uh, members on the minority side, I'd now like to turn to the panel and, and, and welcome you for coming. Um, I'll do an overall introduction of the, of the table, and then we'll go individually at the at the first at our panel is Mr. William Kovac, Senior Vice President, Environment and Technology and Regulatory Affairs for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, welcome. Um, Kirk Lydell, uh, President and CEO of IREX Corporation on behalf of the National Association of Manufacturers. Karen Harned, uh, Executive Director of National Federation of Independent Business Legal Center. And Kevin Rogers, President of the Arizona Farm Bureau Federation. Uh, on behalf of the American Farm Bureau um, Federation. So uh, welcome. I'd like to uh, now recognize Mr. Kovacs. Um, your full statement is submitted for the record. You have five minutes for an opening statement. As you can see, uh, we may not be that pressed for time, so you, you don't have to kill yourself, and, and we'll be very 
patient with, with the clock here. So you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and, and, and Ranking Member Green and members of the committee. Um, I'd like to spend the first minute of my five minutes on how we got here into this regulatory chaos and then to go into some solutions. Uh, Congress has been dealing with what they, what you might call regulatory chaos since 1946. I mean, you've been trying to get control of the agencies when you passed the Administrative Procedure Act, which really was the first time you required the agencies to be somewhat transparent and to involve the public. Uh, and, but unfortunately, over the years, one of the things that happened after this and, and, and within its structure is the Congress passed vague laws that re required uh, the agencies to fill in the blanks. And as the agencies uh, began to fill in the blanks, one of the things happened was the courts began in the 1980s to award deference to the agencies. So you had an agency that was one filling in the blanks, and now the courts were, were, were looking at them as the experts. And this literally uh, allowed them to go from filling in the blanks to writing legislation. And this combination of delegation and deference really has tipped the constitutional scales uh, to the executive branch. Now, Congress has tried it very, very hard, both Republicans and Democrats, to gain control over the agencies. In the 80s, you passed the Regulatory Flexibility Act, Unfunded Mandates, Information Quality Act, later on Data Access, Paperwork Reduction, and in all of your environmental bills, you have some of the best, and the best uh, jobs uh, analysis, pr analysis provisions uh, in the entire uh, body of the U.S. Code. So you've done what you, what you need. I think the conclusion is best summed up when CBO and GAO uh, concluded in several studies that the agencies are literally masters at manipulating uh, the regulatory process. So as you talk about uh, cost benefit or finding out what the $100 million threshold is, uh, they know how to do the system better than you'll ever know how to do the system. So what is it that we can do? Because I think that's really where you want to go. Uh, there are some issues that would hopefully be, be bipartisan. Uh, the first is, uh, in a very simple term, to require the agencies to do just what Congress has asked them to do for years. I mean, if you look, let's just take three, uh, Section 321 of the Clean Air Act. Uh, between Section 321, which requires a continuing jobs analysis for all major regulations, which you haven't gotten in 30 years, that's just beside the point, uh, Section 312 and, and 317, which requires a, a both a cost benefit and an economic assessment, uh, all of which Congress has in there, they're all, manda they're all mandated on the agency. So this isn't a discretionary, uh, this isn't something discretionary. Congress needs to start with that. And frankly, even with the President's executive order, had they, had they decided instead of just doing an executive order, had they demanded that, that, that the agencies implement what Congress has passed, I think we'd be further ahead. Another statute that uh, is, is really an, an excellent statute is unfunded mandates. There are two provisions in unfunded mandates relating to major federal actions, which are very significant. One is that uh, actually be, uh, in, for every major rule, the agency that's over $100 million, the agency actually has to p identify a reasonable number of regulatory alternatives, and, and it must, under Congress's rule, uh, select the least costly and the least burdensome uh, approach to it. And if they don't, then the head of the agency must state why they select a, a more expensive approach. Uh, that's generally honored in the breach or not even, uh, or not even uh, observed. Uh, UMRA also uh, requires before the publication of the rule a statement of anticipated costs and benefits uh, that impact the national economy. So a lot of what Congress is trying to do today on jobs is there. And then you have the Information Quality Act, uh, which is perhaps one of the, the most significant transparency acts that, that Congress has, has ever passed. And, and there you have a requirement that the agencies actually use the most up-to-date data, that they use peer review uh, data based on sound, whether it be science or economics. So you have four acts. Uh, the second issue is uh, permit streamlining. This is an issue that uh, Congress has agreed upon many times in the last several years. We did this uh, report called Project No Project, and we just examined the number of permits that were not being issued uh, in the year uh, 2010 uh, for energy-based facilities, and there were 351. But the key is that by denying those 351 facilities permits, uh, there was, uh, we failed to, to capture about $1.1 trillion in economic activity for our GDP, and we failed to capture, uh, and we lost 
the ability to create 1.9 million jobs annually during the construction period. So this is, not giving a permit is, is significant. And the, the key point in this is the Congress in, I think it was 2006, passed the permit streamlining provisions to safety lieu the highway uh, infrastructure bill bipartisan. And in the Stimulus Act, you had uh, two very different senators, Senator Barrasso and Senator Boxer, coming to an agreement that if you were going to get product projects into commerce, you were going to have to do something uh, with the permitting process, and they used, and, I, and I'll stop after this, and they used, uh, as part of that, uh, they required the most expeditious route possible for addressing NEPA, and uh, that was a categorical exclusion. The, the, the administration was able to use that simple provision over 180,000 times for 220,000 projects. So Congress can come to grips with this, and they, they've shown they can. Uh, it's just a question of going back and enforcing the laws, I think, that you've already got on the books. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Liddell for five minutes, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Simpkis, Ranking Member. If you would just hold it, we're going to get you all yep. set up there. Got to push the button. Yeah, no, thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about reform of the regulatory system and job creation. Um, my name is Kirk Liddell. I'm the President and CEO of IREX Corporation based in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Congressman Pitt's uh, area. Uh, we're very proud of Congressman Pitts. Uh, we are a specialty contracting business. Uh, although we're based in Lancaster, we have operations throughout the United States and Canada. Today we employ approximately 1,500 uh, individuals, many of whom are building trades union members, uh, and that is down from about 2,500, 2,700 uh, in our peak at 2008. So we're down about 1,000 uh, 1, employees. I serve as a board member of the uh, National Association of Manufacturers. I'm a member of their executive committee, and I'm here today testifying on their behalf. Manufacturers provide good, high-paying jobs, and yet we've lost about 2.2 million manufacturing jobs in this economy uh, since the recession, since uh, December of 2009. We have, in fact, generated about uh, 250,000 net new jobs. But the last couple of months, uh, that's slowed. We, we have uh, definitely slowed uh, the job creation uh, over the last few months. And to regain momentum and return to net manufacturing job gains, we, we do need improved economic conditions and improved government policies. And the deluge in regulation the past couple of years has, has not helped us, uh, has not helped us in our effort to create jobs and to improve the economy. Unnecessary or cost ineffective regulations dampen economic growth and hold down job creation. Regulatory change and uncertainty impose high costs on businesses, especially small businesses, disproportionately small businesses. And of course, most manufacturers are small businesses. Unintended adverse consequence of government regulations are also a huge problem and a growing problem. A current example is the EPA's accelerated recondition, uh, reconsideration of the already stringent uh, and costly ozone air quality standard. The Manufacturers Alliance studied this, this one proposal and concluded that it could cost as many as 7.3 million jobs and add, add up to one trillion in new regulatory costs uh, annually between 2020 and 2030. And on behalf of manufacturers, I thank Chairman Shimkus, uh, Representative Barrow and several other members of this subcommittee for sending a letter to EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson uh, in late June uh, urging the EPA to defer its reconsideration uh, until 2013, which is the normal five-year reconsideration time frame. And I would encourage other members of the subcommittee uh, to join uh, that effort. Now, at a broader level, there are a number of uh, powerful and potentially bipartisan regulatory reforms uh, to choose from. Uh, one uh, would be an easy one, I believe, would be for Congress to confirm the authority of OMB's Office of Regulatory Analysis to review the regulations issued by independent regulatory agencies and to ensure their adherence to strong analytical requirements. Uh, we do applaud the President's recent request to independent agencies that they conduct retrospective regulatory reviews of their own regulations. Uh, we believe giving him the formal authority to do so would complement this voluntary request and 
importantly, be a positive sign of seriousness about regulatory reform. Another helpful reform would be strengthening the Regulatory Flexibility Act to ensure that agencies engage in thoughtful analysis of proposed rules and their economic impact on small businesses. Most manufacturers, as I said, are small businesses, and, uh, and agencies should not be permitted to view the law as a mere formality. I would urge the subcommittee's support of H.R. 527, the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, which was favorably reported out of both the Judiciary and Small Business Committees. Congress pays an important role within the regulatory process, but does not have a group of analysts who develop their own cost estimates of proposed or final regulations. OMB has uh, <coughs> OIRA to review regulations, and Congress, perhaps through the Congressional Budget Office, should have a parallel office that analyzes and reviews the impact of significant regulatory initiatives. To truly build a culture of continuous improvement and thoughtful retrospective review of regulations, existing regulations should automatically sunset unless they are affirmatively shown to have strong continued justification. In my written statement, I've included additional broad-based regulatory reform examples for your consideration. I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony today on behalf of manufacturers. I applaud you for holding today's hearing, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'd like to recognize um, uh, Ms. Karen Harnett from the um, Executive Director, National Federation of Independent Business Legal Center. Welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Shimkus and Ranking Member Green. NFIB, the nation's largest small business advocacy organization, commends the subcommittee for examining legislative solutions like those proposed in H.R. 527, which would grow the economy by reducing overly burdensome regulation. The NFIB Research Foundation's Problems and Priorities has found unreasonable government regulations to be a top ten problem for small businesses for the last two decades. Job growth in America remains at recession levels. Small businesses create two-thirds of the net new jobs in this country, Yet those with less than 20 employees have shed more jobs than they have created every quarter but one since the second quarter of 2007, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Moreover, for the first six months of 2011, 17% of small businesses responding to the NFIB Research Foundation's Small Business Economic Trends cite regulation as their single most important problem. Reducing the regulatory burden would go a long way toward giving entrepreneurs the confidence that they need to expand their workforce. NFIB does believe that Congress must take actions like those proposed in H.R. 527 to level that playing field. One key reform would expand the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement and Fairness Act and its Small Business Advocacy Review Panels to all agencies, including independent agencies. In so doing, Regulators would be in a better position to understand how small businesses fundamentally operate, how the regulatory burden disproportionately impacts them, and how the agency can develop simple and concise guidance materials. In reality, small business owners are not walking the halls of federal agencies lobbying about the impact of proposed regulation on their business. Despite great strides in regulatory reform, too often small business owners find out about a regulation after it has taken effect. Expanding SABAR panels and SABRIFA requirements to other agencies would help regulators learn the potential impact of regulations on small business before they are promulgated. It also would help alert small business owners to new regulatory proposals in the first instance. Regulatory agencies often proclaim indirect benefits for regulatory proposals, but they decline to analyze and make publicly available the indirect costs to consumers, such as higher energy costs, jobs loss, and higher prices. The indirect cost of environmental regulations is particularly problematic. It is hard to imagine a new environmental regulation that does not indirectly impact small business. Whether a regulation mandates a new manufacturing process, sets lower emission limits, or requires implementation of new technology, the rule will increase the cost of producing goods and services. Those costs will be passed on to the small business, owner, small business consumers that purchase them. But does that mean that all environmental regulation is bad? 
No, but it does mean that indirect costs must be included in the calculation when analyzing the costs and benefits of new regulatory proposals. NFIB member Jack Boucher of Boucher Electric in Minster, Ohio, for example, recently testified that because of the time and financial costs of EPA-led renovation and repair rules, which took effect in April of 2010, he will no longer bid on residential re renovation projects. Because he will no longer bid on these projects, Mr. Boucher will not be hiring new workers at his company, which has 18 employees, and that's down from 30 employees in 2009. NFIB member Hugh Joyce of James River Air Conditioning in Richmond projected in testimony that new greenhouse gas regulations will add 2 to 10 percent in consulting costs to his projects. This is particularly telling because Mr. Joyce is committed to doing business in an environmentally friendly manner. He is a member of the U.S. Green Building Council and conducts LEED certified greenhousing projects. The moratorium on offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico has indirectly hurt those small businesses that depend on that industry and has impacted all small business owners through further dependence on foreign oil and higher gas prices. Energy costs were ranked as the second biggest problem small business owners face and the NFIB Research Foundation's most recent problems and priorities. Other regulatory forms that would help minimize unintended consequences of regulation on small business include reforms that would strengthen the role of SBA's Office of Advocacy, increase judicial review within SABRIFA, ensure agencies focus adequate resource on compliance assistance, and waive fines and penalties for small businesses the first time they commit a non-harmful error on regulatory paperwork. With job creation continuing at recession levels, Congress needs to take steps to address the growing regulatory burden on small businesses. The proposed reforms in H.R. 527 are a good first step. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Now I would like to recognize Mr. Rogers uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kevin Rogers. I'm a fourth generation farmer from the Phoenix area. My family farms over 7,000 acres. Uh, we produce cotton, alfalfa, wheat, barley, and corn silage. I farm with my dad and my brothers and my sister and my uncle. Currently serve as president of the Arizona Farm Bureau Federation. I'm here on behalf of the American Farm Bureau. I've also served on the USDA Air Quality Task Force uh, for the past 10 years. I'm pleased to be able to testify before this subcommittee. While there are many issues dealing uh, in agriculture, this committee's jurisdiction can, can help us to improve. I wanted to touch on just a few of the more serious issues we have in front of us today. The first issue is the pending EPA decision on revising the ambient air quality standard, uh, coarse particulate matter, uh, PM10, otherwise known as farm dust. Unlike the smaller fine particles, coarse particulate matter is primarily naturally occurring and made up of dirt and other crustal materials. It occurs while driving on unpaved roads, using tractors in the fields, moving livestock from pen to pen and pasture to pasture. Also, Unlike fine particles, where the health impacts are well studied, EPA says for coarse PM, it would be appropriate to consider either retaining or revising the current standard based on the science. Even with the lack of data, the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, KSEC, recommends that the standard level be reduced. EPA is currently considering this option. Many areas in rural America already have difficulty meeting the current standard. Uh, my own county in Maricopa County is currently non-attainment, serious non-attainment, and we're having a hard time meeting the current standard we have. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you probably saw in the, the news the big wall of dust that came through our, our valley, uh, mile high, 50 miles across, it swept through Phoenix. We certainly hope that, that they'll declare that a naturally occurring event and, uh, and give us the exception to the standard for that day. Uh, a recent study shows there will be many more rural areas that will not be able to meet a revised standard. Uh, this will result in more regulation of farming and ranching activities, such as restrictive speed limits on unpaved roads, restrictions on when and how we can work in the fields or move livestock, as states attempt to get back into the attainment area. We favor retaining the current standard, especially where there is little or no science to justify the change of it. We support H.R. 2458 from Mr. Flake that would put a review of the ambient air quality standards on a more reasonable 10-year cycle instead of the current 5-year cycle. Too often, EPA is revising the standards before states have had time to comply with the previous standard. H.R. 2458 would correct this situation. We also support H.R. 2033 
that would exclude naturally occurring events from federal regu regulation unless it causes serious adverse health and welfare effects. A second issue that I would like to address is the continuing regulation of greenhouse gases by EPA. As we have testified previously before this committee, farmers and ranchers receive a double economic jolt from such regulations. First, any cost incurred by utilities, refineries, manufacturers, and other large emitters to comply with greenhouse gas regulatory requirements will pass on to the consumers those costs of production, namely farmers and ranchers. The cost that will be passed down will result in higher fuel and energy costs to grow our food and fiber. Farmers and ranchers, on the other hand, cannot pass these increased costs of production. Secondly, farmers and ranchers will also incur direct cost as a result of the regulation of greenhouse gases by EPA. For the first time, many farms and ranch operations will be subject to direct new source review, prevention of significant deterioration, construction permits, and Title V permits requirements under the Clean Air Act. EPA itself has estimated there are over 37,000 farms that will emit between 100 and 25,000 tons of greenhouse gases per year and thus have to attain the Title V permit. Using EPA's numbers, just the expense of obtaining these permits could cost agriculture over $866 million. On the other hand, this costly burdensome regulatory scheme will produce very little, if any, environmental benefit. Unless and until the countries of the world agree on an international treaty on greenhouse gas emissions, unilateral regulation of greenhouse gases by EPA will have little environmental effect. Farm Bureau strongly supports H.R. 910, which passed the House. In light of the recent Supreme Court decision in American Electric Power versus Connecticut, we believe additional legislation is necessary to clarify that entities cannot be sued just because they emit greenhouse gases. The Court left open the issue of standing and common law actions in the absence of EPA regulatory authority. Legislation is needed to resolve those issues. We thank the subcommittee for its attention to the needs of rural America, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Thank you all for your uh, opening statements. And now I'd like to um, recognize myself for five minutes for the first round of questions. And I want to start with uh, Mr. Kovacs because uh, you you laid out a history of how we got where we're at. You also, I think, implied that if we just enforce some of the laws on the books, this wouldn't happen. Um, I've been interested in this um, this whole judgment fund issue where where um, environmental groups or concerned citizens can uh, sue a, a federal agency and then there is a settlement out of court that is where the plaintiffs want to go without going through the legislative process and then we and then we pay the court the court costs uh, can can I mean that sounds pretty crazy to me is, is that the way that works well, we call it sue and settle, but yes, the judgment fund is part of it. What, what it, it's, a, it's actually a new twist to the regulatory process. Uh, historically, you would go through a rulemaking, you'd give input to, uh, you'd, you'd take input, you'd propose the rule, you'd, you'd respond to the rule, and then eventually it would be litigated. What's happening now um, is that the agency is being sued, and rather than defending itself, it is entering into a consent decree. And as part of the consent decree, it agrees to do two things. One is it agrees to move forward with the regulation that the environmental group or, or NIMBY group wanted. And two, uh, in many instances, it agrees also to pay the attorney's fees. The attorney's fees comes out of the uh, judgment fund, and the judgment fund has been around literally since the beginning of the Republic. But in around 1995, it appears that it was taken off the, uh, off the books, and it's now considered a a permanent, unlimited, non-disclosed uh, fund. And even if you go on to the Treasury Department's website, what you find is a lot of computer code, but you have no idea who the payments are made to. And there have been some uh, attorneys in the United States who have done some discovery in, in very narrow areas, and the numbers are significant. They're in the tens and perhaps hundreds of millions or, or more. So one of the things that, that needs to be done, if you're going to, you have two problems with that process. One is, should the agencies be defending itself? It, it's one thing if the agency thinks that it's completely wrong and that happens and, it, and the agency has the discretion to settle, of course. But when you begin a systematic program of sue and settle where the agency is doing this on a regular basis, and I think we've got, we're up to 16 
of these in, in the last several years, uh, this is becoming more of a pattern of uh, more of a practice. And, and then the second part is, is that there, there is, the agencies are unwilling, mainly the Treasury Department, uh, to provide any of the in information on uh, who is getting the claim. So the government really has no idea, you have no idea who is being paid. That, that's astounding, and, and I think that will give us some focus on something that we should be able to have access to. All citizens should know where their tax dollars are going and who's uh, making um, we're making payments to. Ms. Harnett, I saw you kind of light up. Do you want to add anything to that? No, other than just. I want to go quickly because I got one more oh, okay. question. I would like that. Yes, sir. I, mean, I think that has implications for OIRA's uh, regulatory review process, too, when it is a sue and settle process. I think both in terms of time and substance, it ties their hands somewhat on what kinds of um, review they can, they can do on agency rule. Do you, are you familiar with that, Mr. Kobe? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well that, uh, yeah. No. And, and let me just. Do, is there any truth to the rumor that there may be encouragement by the federal agency, in this case the EPA, uh, encouraging this type of process to move a regulation faster? And uh, have you, Mr. Kovac, do you? Hear, that I've heard that claim. Well, we've, we've heard a lot of claims. The difficulty is when you have an, a, a, a non-disclosed, unlimited appropriation um, and, and you have an agency very willing to not defend its own actions, uh, it, invites that kind of, uh, it invites that kind of conduct, whether or not it's occurring. Uh, that's something really Congress is going, is going to have to determine. Some of these lawsuits uh, are brought and they're relatively quickly settled. Others do happen. Uh, o over time, one of the things w that we are looking at is how many of these exist, because it's not just to, uh, it's not just on regulations uh, that are not on the books and, and someone wants it on the books. There are also, right now, some of these lawsuits are opening up regulations that have been settled for 20 and 30 years, such as coal ash, uh, ozone. Yeah, and let me, thank one. you very much, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, cause I wanna get to Mr. Rogers just for a second. The, uh, mm -hmm. cause I, when Administrator Jackson was here, I put up on the screen the uh, uh, harvesting of soybeans and the, and the dust that comes after that, that ar organic material, uh, I've used that quite a bit to talk about the dust regulation um, to some extent where there, there are some environmental attacks on me saying that that's a bogus claim that these dust regulations will not hurt agricultural America. Obviously your statement says otherwise. Well, I happen to farm right in the Phoenix area and we've been serious non-attainment for a number of years and, and those farmers who are impacted there by the urban area uh, truly have to farm under a different set of rules and regulations that anyone else in the country does. And so as, as our rural America becomes uh, uh, in a non-attainment area, irregardless where they are, um, there's different things you have to do because what you do on the farm is now under a microscope. And if those monitors trigger, wherever the monitors may be located, um, you will have to change your practices to reduce uh, PM10 from your tractor operations. We do it every day. You either don't, you either will stop farming or you'll bring water trailers trailing behind agricultural um, machines to knock the dust down before it gets into the air. Is that true? Well, you have to figure out ways to, to farm without disturbing the soil in any way. And as we've told EPA and as we've told our uh, Department of I think you do that with a stick. You put a we, stick in the yeah. ground, put a corn kernel in the ground. We and tell them sooner or later you have to disturb the soil. I'm way the over my time and I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I have some questions. I appreciate our panel from being here, or for being here. Um, Mr. Kovac, you talked about the judgment fund that was created, and I have a lot of years in the state legislature, and, and uh, I know Congress that was created because at one time, if, if a business sued the federal government for anything, they had to come to Congress to be able to get, even though the judge may have said, okay, federal government was wrong, you owe this money, they had to come to Congress to get permission. We had to pass legislation on every uh, judgment. And that's why you have that. In the state of Texas, we had that problem too. My first years in the 70s in the legislature, we would have to approve literally of every judgment against the state. And frankly, I had a lot of small businesses and businesses who, who were looking for assistance because they couldn't. Now, maybe it's being, uh, what's happening in the court system is wrong and we need to look at that. But I think attacking the judgment system, you may have some of your members of the chamber or the, uh, uh, the independent business folks or even the Farm Bureau who may be concerned that if they want a judgment, 
from, uh, from a federal court that it would be up to Congress to actually pay for it. Do you want to respond to that? Oh, sure. I mean, as I said, the judgment fund's been around since the beginning of the Republic. I, I mean, yeah. if, when you have judgments against you, the United States has to pay. There, yeah. we're, no one is arguing. No one is arguing that. What happened in 1995 is you stopped keep, keeping track of it. And that seems to be where, where the problem is, because in 1990... Maybe that's an entitlement we need to look at. <laughs> well, it, it may be, but the, the difficulty is it's, it's, it's not disclosed, and it's unlimited, and it's permanent. And you have in the system now, because we didn't have this at, at the time, uh, a group of groups that would sue and then enter into settlement agreements where the agency would agree to pay the attorney's fees. There's, the agency should be, set, should be litigating to defend its position. And, and I agree, and, and I don't know if our committee has jurisdiction over that. The, you know, the Judiciary Committee probably has it, but, uh, but I think it's a problem because, you know, it's, it sounds like it's a sweetheart deal, and we may need to address that. Um, the other issue, as is I know, was brought up on sunset legislation, and I've been a supporter of sunset legislation, although it's never passed both the House and the Senate, and uh, because, again, my experience in the legislature where we sunsetted fed, uh, state agencies uh, every 10 to 12 years, and I was on the Sunset Commission, and, and it was a, a terrible job because for a part-time legislature, because you're actually full-time or you're on that commission. In Congress, I guess our compromise is we have reauthorizations. And, you know, bills we do here all the time, we put a five-year reauthorization, seven years, sometimes ten years. Um, sometimes Congress doesn't reauthorize them, so they end up being a rider on appropriations on a yearly basis. Uh, that's our guess, our compromise. But I agree that the sunset legislation would be uh, would be good, although it may be a little duplicate of what we do already with uh, reauthorizations. Um, as I said in my opening statement, the committee's held numerous hearings, examine the regulatory look back process envisioned by the president's executive order uh, of one three five six three, calls for federal agencies to develop the preliminary plans. My understanding that EPA has drafted such a plan, it's opened up for public comment. Um, my question, did each of your organizations provide public comment to the EPA? Did the Chamber of Commerce and... I'm not sure we have yet, but I, I know we will be. Okay. Uh, yes, NFIB has. Have you? Yeah. Well, that's one of the important things about it, because even when, you know, you have to be at the table, and uh, my, believe me, uh, probably more so than a lot of folks coming from my area, we have differences with EPA on a regular basis, uh, but we need to make sure we're there. Do you think EPA and the other agencies are effectively involving stakeholders in the regulatory review process, and what ways could they improve that, uh, their efforts? I mean, EPA is just one agency, but it's pretty all-encompassing, I know, from y'all's businesses. Well, I mean, on, on some of the major regulations, for example, like on the, the comment period for greenhouse gases, an extension of time was, was asked for and it was, was not granted. And that, that was thousands of pages of scientific documents that people were trying to review. So, it, it, you know, one of the things I think you'll find is that there's a disconnect between what I would call uh, the economically significant regulations and everything else. And if you look at the 170,000 regulations that have been adopted by the, by the federal government across since 1976, uh, there's only about roughly about 100 to 200 each year that are economically significant. A lot of the regulations, as you've heard today, are, have general support. They're actually business practices that people want and need. The, the, the difficulty, and, I, and I, I can't stress this enough, is that when Congress began passing these broad statutes and delegating powers to the agencies, that was probably workable, but when the courts gave the agencies deference, you actually found, you got yourself in a position where you're, the law you passed, which was reasonable, once you, add de once you added deference to it, became something where they tipped the balance, the, the constitutional balance of checks and powers. And that's the difficulty you have in today. And with a divided government, it's very difficult to get that power back. And I think that's what we're all struggling with. Well, and I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, but we still have access to the court system. If EPA does something that's, like you said, that's different from what the law, uh, the, the law should be interpreted, uh, we still have access to the judicial process. But again, that's a long process, but uh, because I know at least in the state of Texas, we have a lot of experience in suing EPA. But uh, and yeah. sometimes coming to agreed settlements, right. which is, uh, you know, uh, kind of dividing the, the child, I guess. Well, but Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time.
Thank you, and the uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Thank you to the witnesses, especially to Kirk Liddell from Lancaster, and I'll start with you, Kirk. Um, how does the current regulatory environment in the United States prevent NAM members from being what you cite as your number one issue in your strategy, being the best country in the world to headquarter a company and to attract foreign investment? What specific things from your own company's experience should be enacted in law to make companies want to make their base of operations headquartered in the U.S.? Congressman, there are many, many regulations, of course, that affect the cost of doing business in the United States. And um, oftentimes the cost of uh, these same activities outside of the United States is less. Uh, we, for example, we're, we're primarily an employer. We, we, we hire a lot of people. And the cost of complying with various regulations is a, is a true cost of, of of hiring people. We have to, we're kind of neutral on this. We, we take the world as it is, and we, we recognize that those are costs we have to bear if we, we have to hire people in the United States. So we try to find other ways to satisfy those needs. Sometimes that's hiring people outside of the United States where we can get the work done. We have an office in India, for example, where we can do a lot of the back office things uh, much less expensively and completely, you know, legally and, and the like. Uh, so I think uh, in that case it didn't force us to relocate outside of the country, but that's just an example. And I know a lot of the firms, the big public firms that deal with securities issues and the like are finding a significant extra cost of raising capital and uh, conducting business in the United States and are now, you know, relocating outside of the country and the like. Uh, and Besides the tax code, um, if you could prioritize, prioritize the next most important is regulatory uncertainty. Number two, what would be, you know. Well, I don't have a, a clear list in my mind. I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Yeah. But I just mentioned the securities, uh, the SEC rules and the, and the accounting rules and the like that are uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and the like that are uh, handicapping U.S. companies. Uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis foreign, uh, foreign. If the gentleman would yield, um, yes. if you would submit that to us um, on that list. Sort of a, a, a priority list of uh, things right. that are affecting. That would be helpful uh, to us. Yep. Be happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Harned, uh, many times the executive branch agencies do economic impacts of their rules and either do not apply them as part of the final regulation consideration or possibly misapply them. How important is the application of this criterion in any rule, and how do we prevent bad outcomes from occurring? Right, and that really is the key, is all of the front-end work that I know, truthfully, is <clears throat> frustrating to the regulators, right, because they think that it just makes it harder for them to get a reg out, is so critical. And following, what we want to see is following the letter and the spirit of the law on the front end, making sure that all the costs are assessed, making sure that all the stakeholders are brought to the table, like Mr. Green was alluding to. I mean, that continues to be a problem, quite frankly, within different agencies, including the EPA, with, with rules that they, they are, they're more willing to say, oh, this isn't going to have a significant impact, because they know once they say that, there's going to be a lot more work they're going to have to do on the front end. But the bottom line, from our members' perspective, is doing this front-end work, doing these analyses, making the agencies hold their feet to the fire on this is critical because once the regulation's out, pulling it back is next to impossible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Kovacs, do you believe that Congress delegates too much regulatory authority, um, discretion, uh, thereby allowing the executive branch to write and rewrite congressional intent? Well, I, th I think you've delegated uh, a sufficient amount of regulatory authority that the courts, even in the most recent, the Connecticut versus AEP, put a, a significant amount of the opinion, even though it was dicta, about c congressional delegation. And that once you delegate this, this broad authority to the agencies, uh, they are recognized by the courts as the expert. And, and at that point in time, they're writing the law, yeah. So uh, would gentlemen yell on that? Yes. Time? So would you say that since then the courts really default to the agency because they assume that they're the experts 
so there's really we're talking about it, people could go to court, but you already got the courts almost uh, it, it's way disproportionately to the the federal agency. That's correct. You have you have several. You have absolutely you have several difficulties there. You one you put a relatively low standard in the Administrative Procedure Act as to what the agencies had approved. If they can show something in the record, that's sufficient for the court to, to, to find in their favor. Then in the 1980s, when the courts gave them deference, it literally said not only does the agency not have a high burden of proof, but the, we are going to recognize the agencies as, an, as the experts. So you have really uh, the, the structure of vague laws plus uh, delegation plus deference uh, has put Congress in quite a bind. If I may, there is a reform in H.R. 527 that speaks to this and speaks to the question that you had asked me too, which is when the Office of Advocacy and an agency are to have a disagreement, which does happen with regards to especially to economic impact on small business, it, H.R. 527 would require deference to be made to the Office of Advocacy. And that is a support, that is a reform that we think would be very helpful in this regard in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Very, very good round of questions. Uh, uh, now I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Latta from Ohio. He's, and I'm just in, as an introduction, he's, he's really been focused on this issue, especially in his manufacturing uh, sector in the state of Ohio. So, Mr. Latta, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I appreciate this hearing today. And I'll, I'll let you know right off the bat, I've worked with everyone sitting at this table with your organizations in my state. Uh, I, uh, not too long ago, had asked uh, NAM to give me numbers of members on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, we represented about 1.7 million manufacturing jobs uh, several months ago. The new numbers I got uh, just last week were down to about 1.55 million jobs. You know, jobs is the number one issue that this Congress has got to be facing, and uh, everything that I talk about is about jobs because I, they're fleeing this country, they're fleeing our states, and uh, I'm worried because first, I used to be the largest manufacturing district in the state of Ohio. I've dropped to number two several years ago. This, my district was the eighth largest manufacturing district in Congress. I also represent the largest agricultural district in the state of Ohio. We're large in row crops, and uh, so everything comes right down to jobs, jobs, jobs. And I was very interested in your testimony that you all uh, had uh, talked about today because, uh, you know, so when you're talking about manufacturing, you're manufacturing a product. I, cause what's scaring me now is when I'm talking to my manufacturers in my district, this is what they're telling me. They've come up with a great idea how to make a, a new pencil. And the wholesalers say to them, this is fantastic. Now tell me how you can make this in China at a cheaper price so we can uh, uh, sell it. Not making it here, but making it someplace else, even though they've got the idea right here in this country. And if I could, uh, just to ask a few questions, uh, and I know my time is short, but uh, as, we're, we're, as we're looking, I know that uh, a couple of questions I'd like to ask each of you. I've got m my uh, folks that uh, manufacture in my district that when I've talked to them uh, and after I've heard some of the problems they've had with regulators, they said, why didn't you contact me? And they said they're afraid to. And when the regulators out there have got the fear of God in the people that are uh, in this country that are supposed to be creating jobs, that they don't even contact their elected representatives, there's something wrong. So first, I'd like to ask, uh, you know, on that statement, uh, right down the line for all of you, you know, is there a fear that people have about speaking up about regulations because of the retribution that they get from those regulators? If, if I could, this is um, a very big problem that the small business owners we represent at NFIB tell us about constantly. And what we have seen definitely within the last two to three years is a, or two years, I guess, is a big shift. And you're seeing it in the budget and also in the culture within the agencies to go back to this gotcha type of mentality. And it is very, very um, disheartening to our members and um, really um, almost can be paralyzing to them when we're trying to get them to you know, even know the rules and do the right thing, they, they feel like they can't even ask anybody for help um, to know what that would be because of you know, what uh, microscope that might put in front of their business. I'd say, in general, we're not afraid to contact regulators. We do quite a bit, actually, and, uh, and that's not the issue. It's more just, do we want to get involved in all that? Do we, the time, the effort, the... the um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's oftentimes better just, just, you know, kind of go your own way and, and 
keep a low profile and, and just you know move on. Um, there is some concern that uh, with OSHA and some of the other uh, agencies like that that you'll there'll be some retribution, but personally that that hasn't been a big issue. But you know we're busy people; we don't really have time to spend mm -hmm. a lot of time with you all and regulators and everybody else. We, we have a job to do. Um, I take a, a little bit different or maybe a similar look. I don't know that they're afraid of the regulator. I think they're afraid of the process. And let me just give you a quick example. Uh, if you're a company and you're trying to get an EPA permit, you have 40,000 pages of regulations. Any provision on any of those 40,000 pages will stop you getting a permit, which is why I keep on talking all the time about permit streamlining. So if you, if you can be stopped by, any, by anything, and let's somebody mention Title V, that, Title V of the Clean Air Act, that is merely a paperwork requirement. But once you file that paperwork, anyone in the United States under laws passed by Congress can sue you to stop your permit. So you have 40,000 pages of problems, any one of which you miss is gone. And the second thing is, once you file for an air permit, anyone in the United States can sue you. So I think they're afraid of the process and no one wants to put their head up to be visible. They just want to move through. A comment as well. You know, our folks in agriculture just soon stay on the farm and continue to grow the food and fiber for this country. And, and when you talk about the fear, I think deep down they all assume, well, we got to grow the food. What are they going to, how can they, how can they do that to us? And I think it's more of an education issue for them to get involved and understand what could be coming. So they do contact the representatives and say, hey, um, uh, what we do every day is in peril. It's in jeopardy. And, um, and we need to reach out to you folks and ask you for help to make sure you understand what's going on. Um, uh, there's always that fear of retribution when, when you step up to the plate. In Arizona and Maricopa County, we actually, um, when we understood what the Clean Air Act said, that it's a health-based standard, that it doesn't matter if you only get 8 inches of rain versus 50 inches of rain, uh, the standard is the same across the board. We knew we had to come to the table because EPA has the hammer. Ultimately, they can come in and FIP you federal implementation plan, which could put us out of business depending on um, how that goes. So we came to the table as, as a community and sat down and negotiated a plan for best management practices so farmers uh, will, will reach out and be educated about what's going on. But I think there's a fine line that you bring up. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you very much. And my time has expired, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, witnesses for their time and testimony today. And I uh, appreciate the oppor opportunity to learn from you. Uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, thanks for being here. I'm your neighbor to the north in Colorado, and this committee has spent a lot of time asking regulators questions about whether or not they will have an impact on the economy, whether or not they've taken into account jobs uh, into their analysis. And last week we had a hearing with independent agencies, including FERC, where we, uh, where we asked you know, whether or not they take into account uh, their impact on the economy and jobs. And, uh, the answer was, oh, we certainly do. And then the follow-up was, all right, well, do you take into account uh, the jobs that are impacted, you know, the jobs will be impacted uh, when you implement a rule, and that rule then increases the cost of energy. Do you take into account uh, the jobs impacted by those who've had their energy bills go up, or on those who've had their energy bills go up? And I think the answer was, no, they didn't take a look at that. And so uh, we've had some good opportunities to really learn what's happening uh, what's happening in this country when it comes to the economy. Your testimony talked about the impact that greenhouse gas regulations would have on farming and on agriculture. Your testimony goes into statements made uh, before the Energy and Commerce Committee by Administrator Jackson when it comes to uh, agriculture. We heard, I heard uh, testimony from the Administrator uh, over and over. She said that agriculture is exempt from greenhouse gas regulations. Do you believe that to be true? Well, um, I haven't seen that specifically in, in law anywhere where uh, EPA or, or Congress has exempted us from us. But I think as you narrow down the Title V requirements and you narrow down what happens when, when there's a lawsuit brought up and, and EPA is sued for not enforcing the rules and regs that they have and enforcing uh, what Congress has passed over the years, um, and until they specifically come out with, with a change, you know, if you've got more than you know, 50 head of cattle, uh, depending on what they determine, uh, you could be required to get this permit. And so 50, 50 head of cattle, you could be required to have a permit. Can, can anybody survive with 50 head of cattle? Can you make it as, no. a, as a rancher with no, 50 head of cattle? No, not at all. Can not you make all. it as a family farm operation with 50 head of cattle? No. No, it's difficult. 
If, if cap and trade had passed, when cap and trade bill passed last year, uh, there was conversations that agriculture was exempt. If, even if agriculture, if a tractor, if a cow, uh, if your farm had been directly exempted from that act, would the consequence of cap and trade still have affected and impacted agriculture? Certainly, it will be devastating on agriculture as well as all the business community. The, the things that we do, uh, the fertilizers I use, the energy, the diesel fuel, uh, all the inputs that I use in agriculture, uh, the prices will skyrocket due to that. And those, those trickle-down effects will be devastating to our industry. We have no way to pass those costs on to our consumers at all. Do we have any assurance from uh, Lisa Jackson, Mr. Jackson, that agriculture will not be included in future greenhouse regulations? I believe the uh, so-called exemption for agriculture expires in 2013. Do we know what happens beyond? I do not know. Uh, and so there's a, a large possibility that we could see these uh, regulations applying directly to, ag to agriculture, including what's referenced to in your uh, testimony as a cow tax. That's correct. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. And I uh, yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Whitfield uh, from, for uh, five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, this is such an interesting topic and I think a vitally important area because, as many of you pointed out in your testimony, these regulatory bodies, and particularly EPA and the Clean Air Act, are issuing more and more and more regulations, and it's uh, almost unprecedented uh, the, the way that they're moving over at e EPA. And I was delighted that you uh, brought up, Mr. Kovacs, this uh, sue and settle, because uh, many of us feel like that's precisely what's happening, that the courts are making the decisions about environmental policy. And what makes it even worse is that we asked recently for EPA to provide us a list of all the organizations that they've been giving grants to, and they are making large sums, uh, they have a large uh, some of money to give grants, and many of those grants are going to the environmental groups that then, then turn around and file the lawsuits, and then, as you say, they enter into a consent decree, and then they pay all the legal fees. And it's almost like an in-house job here, and, and it, it, it's uh, not the way we need to do uh, policy in the United States. And I, I think your point about this judgment fund definitely needs to be looked at because we need transparency there. We need to know how much money is being spent. Uh, we've asked EPA how many lawsuits that they have pending against them, and they haven't been totally direct, but the indications are that there's somewhere between four and 500 lawsuits pending right now against EPA. And as Chairman Shimka said, we have reason to believe from discussions with a lot of different groups that EPA is actually out there encouraging these lawsuits. And I might just also add that on the TVA lawsuit, the Sierra Club filed suit against TVA. And uh, TVA, according to its president, was not even allowed to hire its own legal counsel to defend itself in that suit. But the Solicitor General and EPA lawyers defended them and they agreed in a consent decree to close down 18 coal-powered plants and pay the Sierra Club millions of dollars in not only legal fees but also contributions to them for to use in whatever way they wanted to. So uh, one, I get so worked up about it, and I need to be asking questions, but <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lytle, uh, I've been told that you're an expert on the da Data Quality Act, we hear many people say, well, the Data Quality Act is a way that you can uh, question the models being used in calculating cost and benefit analysis. Has your firm used the Data Quality Act? We have not, and I don't know where you got that about me being an expert oh. in that. I don't, I don't feel I am. Oh, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> so, but are you, are you familiar with the Data Quality Act? I think you should do this. Is it, is it, are any of you from? I'm, from I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the Data Quality Act. Uh, that's probably, even though it was only a few sentences, one of the finest laws Congress ever passed. And right. It attempted to do something very simple, which is to require agencies to use the absolute best data that was useful, up-to-date, and transparent, and it allowed the public to actually 
correct the data if the agency found that it was wrong. And you passed it, I believe, in 2001. Uh, we litigated it for, for several years, and the courts made the decision that, um, un unlike the NEPA, for example, where they said anyone has a right to sue, a similar type of statute, the courts ruled that uh, no one has a right to sue, and it's completely between uh, OMB and the agencies as to how they want to require data to enter the system. And one of the things that, that I would suggest is there is an example where if there was a private right of action where when I submit data to the agency, they have an obligation to review it because let me tell you, when you, when we as a private party decide that we are going to submit data, it, first of all, it's very expensive. We have to go out and hire our own scientists. We have to do our own studies. We have to develop our own models. Then we have to submit it. And for the agency not even to review the data after it's submitted, and all we're asking them to do is correct it if it's wrong or tell us why you're right. And that's the whole purpose of the law. Right. And that's been frustrated since 2003. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the system is broken. You know, whether you have a conservative administration or a liberal administration, there needs to be more balance in this process because <clears throat> you get the, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs that are reviewing these regulations over at OMB, and that's controlled by the administration. The agencies are controlled by whoever is in charge of the, of the government at that time. And that it, it appears that there definitely needs to be some independent source to have the ability to analyze what's going on in these agencies because no one, the, the models used, the, there's a, a lack of transparency there. And when you start calculating the value of a life and the way they determine economic value of a life, it, no one really understands it. So would you all agree that there needs to be some independent analysis of cost benefits that these agencies make in issuing these regulations? I certainly would. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, my time has run out too, but I hope that we would have an opportunity to work with you and your organizations and try to develop some legislation to help address some of these shortcomings. Great, thank you. Uh, I just want, for the record, let in that last question you posed that all the panelists agreed and said yes, just for the record. Um, oh, the chair now recognizes the vice chairman of the uh, subcommittee, Mr. Murphy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to follow up on that very question and give all of you a chance to respond to that with regard to reviewing these regulations. Uh, we, uh, when we just dealt with uh, <coughs> a bill moved out of the full committee dealing with coal ash issues. It was simply to ask uh, members of the President's Cabinet to comment on uh, economic impact and job impact. I was amazed at the amount of um, uh, dispute we had among our committee members about whether or not we should even require the administration to make references to jobs. So given the year from uh, so many different organizations represented here, I wonder if you could comment more on this about having independent uh, uh, reviewers review some of these uh, regulatory issues and, and guidelines and comment on what you think uh, the benefits of that would be. Mr. Kovacs, you want to start out with that? Uh, sure. The, um, well, if there's, any, if there's any issue that's important to the institution of Congress, it's getting at least some parity with agencies, which is something you don't have now. And in the present system, the way it's structured is even under your regulatory laws like uh, uh, the unfunded mandates where they require this kind of an analysis, uh, the way the law is structured is they could, they could give you a half a page which says we did everything and everything's fine, and that's sufficient for court review, and that's the difficulty. But that's the law that you structured. But what, because so much of the economy with 170,000 plus regulations belongs to the agencies, because they have this deference, and because the courts look at them as the experts, you really have no ability at this point in time to really check the agencies. And short of being able to pass a new law which regains this kind of authority, you're at a great disadvantage as an institution. Mr. Lydell, could you comment on that? Well, it's certainly a uh, strong, good idea to, uh, to have independent analysis and, and certainly be strongly supportive of that. I guess uh, some of our frustrations is oftentimes when we do, kind of like Mr. Kovac said, we do provide information, well thought out information, information that we've worked hard to develop. Um, it's still up to the agencies to kind of determine whether they're going to, you know, listen to it, think about it, you know, give it substantive value. And uh, I'm not quite sure uh, that it's so much the, the issue of the quality of the data, it's the, uh, 
uh, the willingness of the, the organization, the agency, to, uh, to seriously consider the value and, and the ability to do so. Uh, you know, one of the things on, on job impact is, you know, there are multiple levels. First, uh, will the agency consider job impact? That's important. That was sort of question number one. Um, uh, and then sort of there's another question is, can they do that? When I think about, as a business person, all the things we do, all the incentives that are created by regulations to, to reduce jobs, uh, I'm not sure that, um, uh, that, that anybody is able to really consider all the unintended consequences and the impacts on jobs. Um, so that is an issue, and I'm not sure independent analysis would do that. I think some kind of real-world pragmatic experience uh, might do that. Wait, um, let me make sure I understand this. So, say when it comes to analyzing impact on jobs, perhaps those doing the analysis should be people who have created jobs. Yes, uh, oddly enough, I think well, people who have uh, sat in the seat of so not like just creating contracts. So yeah. like if you have a problem with your health, go to a doctor as opposed to just, okay, thank you. Thanks. Ms. Harney. Yes, no, I think that um, this is a very interesting idea. And really what we see um, after Congress gets, you know, these procedural protections in place that are really meant to get small business impact, which is obviously our most, our most important thing, the SABRIFA amendments and, and the Regulatory Flexibility Act, you start seeing, and we, we definitely see this with, with all the agencies, a check the box mentality like you know we go through and we've done that small business impact analysis and and they know how to do it just just enough to meet their obligation and I think it, more oversight that Congress can give to ensure that that process was was really done completely in particular when you're looking at um, things like um, did the agency really consider less burdensome alternatives and seriously consider those alternatives and what, what that could mean for getting the job done from a policy perspective, from their perspective, but not hurt, you know, job creators and the economy um, and leave everybody in, in the wake. So I think that, that those kinds of issues really do need uh, more congressional oversight. Um, and that, again, is I think that particular reform on the less burdensome alternatives is in H.R. 527, which uh, Mr. Liddell indicated just was marked up and passed. Uh, we could support the uh, independent review. Uh, we're always looking for ways to uh, reform regulations, and I, I'll bring it back to PM10 and the dust issue. Um, all that's done a lot on modeling, and if, if they don't have the research on coarse particulate matters, they'll make it up because that's what the modeling requires. They have to plug in a coefficient somewhere so that they can put a number in to decide how to regulate you. And so uh, we are all for... Um, for doing more research and, and making sure that the models they use are correct because uh, they have to have them to plug them in to determine whether or not we're attainment or non-attainment. I appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, you know, it, as you know, that this town is often so poisoned by things and it's not a matter that sometimes people look at uh, what a document says, but who says it, that sometimes people decide before they even read it if it's a value and it's oftentimes looked upon not what a regulation does for jobs, but what it does for votes. Uh, I tend to think that's an insult to job makers and, and workers too, but thank you very much, I appreciate it. And I think my, my friend, uh, uh, I do plan, based upon time, maybe to do a second round just to ask additional questions, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for coming forward today with their testimony. I'm, I'm sensitive to, to the topic that we're talking about today. I, I represent, as most of my colleagues know, a, a largely rural district that depends very heavily on agriculture, and we depend also on manufacturing. Uh, it is important to me that my constituents continue to have uh, the opportunity to produce goods and put bread on the table, and sometimes that means examining the flexibility and the timing and the efficacy of particular rules. Having said that, I'm deeply concerned that this committee is turning into the No Regulation Committee. Now, we have spent a majority of our hearings and markups not developing new plans in energy and telecom and health care, uh, but instead breaking out the eraser for any and all Obama administration proposed rules. While I support review of these rules, at least some of them, and, and, and after careful consideration of 
impacts during these trying economic times, uh, these hearings began to smack of political rabble rising. Uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Rogers, and thank you, Mr. Rogers, for your testimony. Uh, I have a few questions uh, for you. Uh, you state in your testimony that 37,000 agricultural facilities will be covered by the greenhouse gas rule and will be forced to spend over $20,000 on permits. I hope I'm restating your, your testimony. Uh, this rule has been in effect since January. Uh, how many facilities have gone have, have had to get a permit thus far, if you know? These are the permits here. That's what would be. Okay. I don't have that number right this minute, sir. Based on our research, it would be absolutely none. Uh, why have these facilities not had to purchase permits? Do you do you know that? Yeah. I believe that EPA is still determining what the magic number is. I don't think the the final rule is out on on what what's going to be required. Um, they're working with with uh, one of the new committees they just put together, the EPA and Agriculture and Rural Rural Committee, uh, to help decipher what what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. Well, under the tailoring rule, can you tell me when any of these facilities will be subject to a Title V or, or an NSR permit? No, I can't. It's, it will depend on when EPA determines that that regulation will, will be enforced. Projected costs are always a complicated subject for rules and regulations. Often the estimates vary widely from those pr pr produced by advocacy organizations, uh, EPA and industry groups. However, I would note a study from 2010 by Resources for the Future, uh, which I ask unanimous consent to be added to the record, uh, where the researchers found that EPA and other agencies routinely overestimate potential cost. In fact, of, of the 17 rules studied, 14 were found to have cost less, uh, sometimes considerably less, than their estimates. Uh, Mr. Kovacs, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, could it be possible that these rules help drive innovation quicker and than a baseline scenario, thus lowering costs um, below the projected amounts? Well, Congressman, there, there is more than sufficient controversy over, over the cost estimate analysis and the kind of assumptions you use because you can make it come out depending on the assumptions any way you want. I can only tell you how, you know, when we do a study, how we do it and how we do our audits and, and, and how we do peer review. Uh, but when you get into a study like that, one of the things that's the most important is what are the assumptions that they've used? Do they, do they assume that EPA will implement it? Do they assume that it won't? Do they assume innovation? Do they assume it won't? And I think on that, each regulation is different. And one of the things uh, that the agency seriously wanted to address this issue, that right up front in the Unfunded Mandates Act, for example, they have to do some kind of, a, of, a re of an analysis of of, of what are the anticipated costs and benefits and the impact on, on the society so that as part of the rule, we can begin that discussion. That generally does not happen. So I think there's a lot of room in that area for, for solid discussion among, among everyone. Uh, this was certainly the case with the Asset Rain Program. Uh, are, is there any other reason as to why it might be lower that you could think well, of? A Asset Rain had a lot of things going on simultaneously. I mean, it, my recollection is uh, that at the same time you did acid rain, you had the Staggers Act, uh, the, the distinguished chairman of this committee, which deregulated the railroads and you began to move low sulfur coal from the west to the east. So you had a few factors. And I think if you look at the history books and the law journal articles, there's a great debate as to whether it was regulation or low sulfur coal and the deregulation of the railroads. Thank you. We're right on target. Thank you, Mr. And I thank you. And it, it would, uh, I hope my colleagues don't mind, since you're here, I'd like to go to a second round. Um, and I just want to follow up on that because that is so true on the acid rain and the 92 Clean Air Act is that there's two issues, fuel switching and technology. And that's the problem we have with, with the greenhouse gas issue is we don't have the technology. You know, we're trying. So for in Illinois where we have high sulfur coal, that's where I know you've never seen that poster of mine with those miners. But uh, they lost their jobs because they fuel switched. That's really the debate. They moved a little sulfur coal from... Montana, and the power plant's still there. The mine across the street was closed. So, but, uh, so that's a little bit, I, I would agree with you on that analysis. And I, I just want to go to Mr. Liddell and Mr. Rogers, because they're the actual producers, actually 
job. When you decide to make a decision, either one, to expand a manufacturing facility or to buy 500 more acres, don't you do a cost-benefit analysis? Absolutely. You have to. Mr. Rogers? Without a doubt. You and why do you do that? Why do you do that, Mr. Leda? Why do you do that? Well, it, it seems, seems obvious you don't want to spend more than you're going to get in return from an investment. And it's critical that you measure all the costs, all the assumptions, all the risks, and, and end up with a high level of confidence that you're going to be better off for having made that investment than not, or else you're not going to go forward. Right. Mr. Rogers? And we have to look at commodity prices. Do I have enough labor? Do I have enough equipment? Um, what, what's it going to mean to my banker if I increase the size of my farm? Uh, can, I, can I borrow the extra funds for the cost of production of that 500 acres? You know, to grow 500 acres of cotton, um, you know, it right. costs $1,000 an acre, so there's an extra half million dollars right off the top. So our, our point is, is that uh, this is nothing abnormal in the business sector. And that's our point. The, the, the subcommittee has been renamed Environment and the Economy. And the reason why is we want to continue to grow an economy, and we're, we're checking upon, and we're trying to do that balance between environmental regs that are needed, I've even stated the Clean Air Act has been very beneficial, but there is an, ef an effect on the economy, and that's why your testimony is so great today. Um, uh, Ms. Harn, um, I think it was your opening statement, you mentioned the uh, Beryl Shimkus letter on the Knox. Who did that? Okay. Mr. Lydell? Uh, explain that one more time. I, I think this is very important. This gives you an example how environmental agencies intervene, intervene, distort the ability of a business to plan because what's going on in this situation? Well, this is the, the, uh, the ozone yeah. uh, uh, review that, uh, that EPA has taken on. Uh, when, when, were they when are they supposed well, to do five this year, review? It's a five-year five process. Pl process. And where are we at in that five years? Well, 2013 would be the normal time for the review. So the review is due in 2013, but the agency is doing it now. Correct. Why? Uh, well, uh, I think they have a mission. Uh, they want to see the standards tightened. And what's that effect on jobs and the economy? Well, we have a pretty good uh, measure on that from a study. And again, you know, subject to uh, some give and take, uh, we're looking at, uh, I think it's... Uh, what do they think? 7.3 7 million uh, jobs, as many as 7.3 million do, uh, jobs, and about a trillion in new regulatory costs annually between 2020 and 2030. So, uh, I mean, that's Exhibit A of numerous exhibits of, I mean, you aren't asking them not to do this. No. They're, they're, they should do it by their rules and regs two years from now but they're moving it for as if they don't have anything else to do? Well, and as if they don't seem to understand what's going on in the economy right now. I mean, uh, if you're ever going to have an impact on jobs, now, now's not the time to have a negative impact on jobs. Yeah, and I've taken a lot of uh, notes. Of course, I'm, I'm all over the place. I do really appreciate uh, your testimony. It's given us some issues. Uh, I would also encourage you all uh, specific rifle shots of things that we can do. We're very interested in doing that, trying to, again, uh, protect public health, but also bring some certainty in this uncertain times to keep the economy where it's at and actually start growing again. And while I have my last 18 seconds left, uh, fortunately, we're going to second round of questions because in the back is uh, the people responsible for me being either good or bad, depending upon who's looking at me as a member of Congress, my mom and dad. So I want to recognize them as they walk in. So they're here for the baseball game. So, uh, so with that, uh, is anyone else seek time to uh, 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 chair recognize Mr. Green for five minutes? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I want to recognize your parents. Uh, your son and I played basketball together when we were much younger. <laughs> and, uh, Congress, so uh, now we just spar verbally instead of bumping into each other on the court. Um, I get lots of emails and requests from my constituents uh, on a program that would be a federal mandate, and I was wondering if any of your agencies or associations have taken a stand on it. Uh, the E-Verify program uh, was created to try and deal with federal contractors 
so we would know, at least on the federal level, if someone was uh, on a contract that was in, uh, paid for by the federal government, that we would make sure that their social security numbers are correct. And I'm just getting a number of emails requesting we expand that. Uh, I have some concern because I think we've done a study for the GAO or someone that said, you know, sometimes, you know, I, my name is Gene Green. I've always been known by that. But the IRS knows me by Raymond Eugene Green, and that's my Social Security number. That uh, if we apply that E-Verify, uh, what would it do to a farming operation or, or a restaurant or, or anybody who's a member of any of the, your associations? Uh, Mr. Green, it's something I've had to deal with in Arizona um, for the last couple of years is mandatory E-Verify. And I will tell you that it's, in my opinion, uh, is a is a leader of agriculture organization. It's not ready for prime time. It is not ready to go nationwide. It doesn't specifically, I can run your name and your social security number through the process, and it says, yes, you're good to work, but it could be somebody else that has your information. And, and so that puts me at risk in a couple of lawsuits because if I do hire you and come to find out that it's wrong, then I'm in trouble. But if I don't hire you, then I'm in trouble as well. And so um, we understand technology is coming and needs to be there uh, organizationally. Um, we don't think it's good in this economy to put business under more regulations and more scrutiny and turn uh, this program into a program that determines whether I hire you or not. Um, and, and in agriculture, we're concerned about labor. We've been on the Hill for a num number of years asking for temporary worker programs. We have to have workers to harvest our crops. Um, and so we're concerned that if E-Verify comes down the path without some kind of temporary worker program or reform in some way, uh, agriculture will be devastated. And that was imposed by the state, not by the federal correct. government. Correct. That's correct. So we've, we've had the experience um, with, with a, where the state imposed that law man, mandating it, and it's, it's practically impossible to hire somebody. Would the gentleman yield on that same point? Uh, sure. Um, if if the laws were passed to indemnify the employer, would that help? In other words, if you've done everything right, and then you're not held liable to litigation? That would certainly be a step in the right direction. Our problem is there's not enough people who want to come work in Bell Hay at 3 o'clock in the morning, milk cows all night, and cut lettuce every day. And With 9.2 percent unemployment? That's exactly correct. Well, uh, let me ask I, the other associations, because I only have two minutes left, uh, and both of your association taking a stand on uh, the potential for federal legislation on E-Verify. Could I comment as, as a as a business person, we're very familiar with E-Verify. We hire uh, people all over the country, and we're, we're uh, hiring uh, and rehiring and laying off. We have a transient employee, transient workforce. The problem with us and E-Verify is that uh, kind of the unintended consequences, the, uh, the, the, the rules haven't thought through the fact that you're going to hire somebody, put them on a job site today, and there's time that it takes t for them to, uh, uh, that they can't go to work. Uh, it, there's extra burden, extra cost associated with it. So it's more the mechanics of E-Verify than the, than, the, than the theory or the concept of E-Verify that's our problem. Has the Chamber of Commerce made well, a determination? I, well, I would be very thrilled to uh, have our Labor Division send you a, a, a response for the record. Okay, appreciate it. Right, and I'm gonna, we'll have to get back to you on that as well. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, that was just an example. In this case, it's a state-imposed regulation, because I know some states are doing that, and uh, that it can cause problems in just producing a product. So. Well, and we are using the federal program. I mean, Arizona didn't develop a new program. We're mandated to use yeah, E-Verify, and um, it's not very workable right now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great questions. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Kovacs, would you mind getting back to us on this Data Quality Act uh, on ways that it could be improved? Because I don't have an in-depth understanding of it, but it is my understanding that you really cannot utilize it until the rule has become final. Um, and then at that point, as Ms. Harnett said, once a rule becomes final, <laughs> From a practical standpoint, there's not a lot can be done. So, if if you wouldn't mind, I, I would be glad to. W w w we would really appreciate that. Just one quick point on that: yeah. uh, the way the law is structured is you should be able to use it not only in the, as part of the rulemaking process, but literally at any other place in the in the agency process where they're doing studies, whether they be economic or scientific, uh, so that you can go in and actually input into the study 
uh, so that the agency gets it right at the end. It's supposed to begin in the beginning, not at the but end. But you have to file a lawsuit, right? Uh, you can file what they call a petition for correction. It's just that the agencies really aren't addressing them at all. And the, and the courts have said that we don't have a, a right to sue. Right, okay. Um, on this national ambient air quality standard, you all have already pointed out that the EPA is moving in advance of when they are really required to. Do any of you <clears throat> have any information right now about what percent of the population live in non-attainment areas right now? I just know, I just know in Arizona um, that it's it's Maricopa County, which is the urban area. You know, in Arizona, we only have 15 counties compared to some of your states that have, you know, hundreds of counties. Right. Uh, so it's a monster county. Um, but uh, uh, and it, it, it tends to be more of an urban issue. The, the issue we have is those of us that farm in that area um, get sucked into the regulation, get sucked into the cleanup. And, and we've agreed we all need to step up and do our fair share to... But uh, you're in non-attainment now. That's correct. We're in non-attainment yeah. now at and 150. Yeah. And if the proposal goes through and they change it to either 65, 75, or 85, um, all of our data shows the entire state will become non-attainment. Yeah. yeah, and I think a big portion of the whole country will be in non-attainment. And then that's going to, as you say, Mr. Little, Lytle, it's going to have a real negative impact on job creation because everybody's going to be limited in the development in their area. Uh, one other comment I would make on how aggressive EPA is being, Congress on two or three separate occasions explicitly said no to greenhouse gas regulation under the Clean Air Act. One was in 1990 when the Clean Air Act was last amended. There actually was a vote at that time on an amendment about greenhouse gas and that was rejected and then uh, the U.S. Senate uh, you uh, rejected almost unanimously the Kyoto Protocol, and then there was another vote in the House on it. But because of that tailoring rule, you know, they've expanded that now, and of course there are lawsuits pending on that as well. But I, for one, think that I know that the Clean Air Act is almost sacrosanct, but the last time we looked at it in any depth was 1990. And I genuinely believe that it should be re reviewed because a lot of things have happened since 1990. And uh, so I would hope that at some point down the road that we might get into reviewing the Clean Air Act in its in entirety. And uh, I yield back balance my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair recognized gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, for five minutes. Thank you. Just a couple of quick items here. I want to ask about another area, and that's guidance documents. So we talk about regulations, but uh, those have some enforcement about it. Guidance documents, as you know, are just something that various agencies says, we think you ought to do this. But it's no force on that. Uh, can you describe some impact that some of those might have upon uh, some jobs and economic development? Whoever wants to comment on those things. Nobody wants to say anything on that. Ms. Kovacs? I mean, if you, if you go strictly by the way the courts have applied it, that if it has no impact on the rights of a of a citizen, it's, it's truly guidance. The difficulty that we have is if you have 170,000 regulations, you probably have 400,000 documents or 400,000 guidance, 400, guidance documents. And many of the documents can be used uh, as part of an inspection so that even though it's only guidance, the question is, uh, do you have to comply? And if, you, and if you don't comply, the difficulty you have is you have to really defend that in, in court. So the guidance puts parameters around it. And, it, and theoretically, it doesn't have any impact. Uh, but in most of the major, re re in most of the regulation or most of the legislation that, that addresses it, uh, it goes after guidance. And, and as well as when John Graham was administrator of OIRA, uh, as part of how he administered, he did put out guidance on guidance and how you ha it had to be truly non, it had to be truly not impacting rights, and that seems to be the distinction. If it impacts a right, it's certainly a regulation and should go through the process. If it impacts no rights, uh, then it really shouldn't matter and you should be able to disregard it. Unfortunately, in an inspection, for example, uh, you really get put in the position of defending yourself. Right. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying I'll be with you a second, but that, so that is, so if someone's inspecting a factory, a pharmaceutical company or something, and they have these, these guidance and they'll ask, have you done the following things, and if the owner of that plant says no, then they say, then you have to do them. 
uh, or else they're brought to court. They can defend. They can win the case if it's just guidance, but they still have to defend their that, position. That would be the case, yes. Okay. That's and I, I've actually seen that when I, I used to practice law in defending a small business owner um, at an administrative hearing level. We saw, um, truthfully, an inspector overuse the guidance against the, um, the uh, small business owner pulling out one of the factors that was in a guidance as something that he he shouldn't have done and he did. And so um, I've seen that as a practical matter. I would also say just more generally though, small business owners really work hard to keep up with the regulations that are on the books. So they, there is a great concern in the small business community that when you've got a guidance material on top of that that they need to know about and that's you know not really readily apparent to them, um, as Mr. Kovac said, it really is in the enforcement area that we see the bigger problems with that, and small business owners often don't even know they exist. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that issue? Well, yes, Mr. Make, uh, we had one, one experience, a risk experience that, that comes to mind. I think, you know, we're, as business people, kind of, <laughs> we're not looking to fight. Uh, we're looking to, to, to comply with the rules. So. You know, guidance documents to us are, are, are the Bible. I mean, we, we, we follow those. And I can remember one specific thing. You know, our board of directors was talking about, you know, which course of action can we take. There was a guidance document there. We follow it. We're, we're, you know, and um, so they, they almost have, at least on companies like ours, the impact of, of a regulation or of law. Thank you. I'd like to uh, point out uh, three final things, Mr. Chairman. One is I, I certainly encourage all members of this and other committees in Congress to spend some time touring offices and factories and farms and in the midst of that tour, uh, instead of just photo ops, asking to see what those guidance documents and regulations are and how they go along with it. It's a, a good, worthwhile thing to do and it will open the eyes. Second thing I'd like to point out in relation to the other question I asked before about regulations. Um, Back in the Herbert Hoover administration, June 1930, when Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley Act and put, imposed 59% tariffs on things, at that time the uh, American Economic uh, Association, I think it was, sent a thousand some uh, petitions to veto the act, and he didn't, and we know what that did uh, when they did not listen to independent people. And third, I just thought it's unanimous consent. I'd like to ask to have the, uh, this powerful subcommittee on the environment declare this Mr. and Mrs. Shimkus Day. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could just uh, re reclaim the uh, 15 seconds remaining and ask this question. Should federal agency guidance documents be subject to proposal and comment period like regulations? What, what do you think? Certainly, if they have if they have an impact, I mean, if, if the agency is anticipating that even as a part of an inspection they have to be complied with, they should be subject to uh, regulatory proceedings. Ms. Ludell, you don't care. I, well, <laughs> we do treat them as no, I, I, so, I, I, so I would say was, yeah, they should go through yeah. the process to the extent the process is a, is a good one. Ms. Harney, we would support that. Ms. I would agree. Great, thing. I really appreciate your time this morning. Uh, and uh, we, we will take your, your comments and uh, put them through the mix and see what if we can do with this committee or uh, maybe other committees at jurisdiction. Appreciate my, my colleagues for their attendance. Appreciate my mom and dad for being in the audience. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, adjourn this hearing.